beginning of August of uh, 2011, we moved into uh, Amelia Park, and when we first got there, it wasn't really uh, nothing unusual that we seen or heard. You know, just kind of everyday, um, everyday living, everyday thing, and. Um, Probably about the second week we was into the house, Misty, my wife, uh, started babysitting um, her dog, which was this little Wusty. And the first night, that dog was going absolutely crazy. Like, it would just bark in midair and just, uh, just, just constantly acting just weird. And, and then kind of in the back of my mind, I, I thought that there was something in the house, but I wasn't sure. I want to start by saying I am a Christian um, and I know they say that you know as Christians you know you shouldn't really believe in that kind of stuff but um, I really had seen it firsthand and felt it firsthand. Um, I've never lived in a place that I've been so scared and so happy to leave. Pets can pick up them type of vibes and I ended up texting them and just kind of mentioned something about the, because the family that lived there ended up moving out to a different house and we moved into it. And I texted them and asked them, uh, you know, do they have any experience, whatever, when they never responded. And, and so I just thought it was just, you know, the dog was new there and didn't know better. So weeks went by and, um, you know, the dog just like almost, same time every night the dog would start acting like that. And it was probably like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. The dog would just go absolutely crazy. I mean, it, would, it even kind of snap at the kids and stuff too, you know, and, and her sister said the dog wasn't like that. I mean, so she was pretty much um, confused by the whole ordeal. So two weeks go by and the dog leaves. Everything my husband said was the truth. Um, there is nights that I would lay in the room by myself and I would actually fall asleep, but then I'd wake up to my bed shaking like a, like a vibrating. And I would just lay there and just like not even want to move because just scared to get out of the bed, scared to even move. I also would hear footsteps um, and that happened a lot. And I would a lot of times get up and nobody was there. When the dog left and we're all sitting around and Mariah, my 10 year old daughter was having a birthday party and um, me and my nephew Austin was downstairs um, playing video games and they ended up coming and get me. Or, well, she actually, she yelled my name. And I went up there to see what was going on and there's like five or six girls in a the room, they're all watching TV and they were saying that her door kept opening halfway and then closing within like every couple of minutes and it was freaking them out. Well, they thought it was their older brother Jason doing it. And Jason was laying in his room, texting on his phone. And, you know, I said, Jason, are you messing with the girls? And he's like, no, I'm, I'm sitting there watching it myself. So, um, you know, I went back in there and told him, I was like, well, you know, this is your brother messing with you, you know, because I don't want to freak him out. So I went back downstairs and told my nephew, like, you know, what was going on or whatever. And that was pretty much the end of that. Also, the night when it happened with Mariah, I was actually laying in bed, and um, she was telling me that her door was opening and shutting, and I thought Jason was playing with her, and he actually wasn't. Well, about a week and a half later, um, Mariah ends up calling my name again, and she's saying that her door keeps opening and closing. And I just told her, I said, well, your window's kind of cracked open a little bit. It's just the wind. Well, at that time, uh, my brother-in-law, Tim, was there spending the night. And um, everybody was upstairs besides me and him. We was downstairs watching TV. It was about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And I was telling them, we were sitting on the couch, and I was telling them what was, you know, kind of the things that's been going on. I think like other kids have been hearing like footsteps throughout the house and stuff like that. I mean, I probably heard it too, but just didn't never pay much attention to it. And at that time, uh, he was getting up and he was going into the kitchen and he was getting a drink out of the kitchen sink. And as I was turning around, continuing to keep talking to him, because the couch, you know, the couch is facing like this, the dining room's behind me, and then it's just like one big open area, and then this dining room, the kitchen, there's no separate walls or anything, it's just one big open space. And he was walking to the kitchen, getting something to drink. And as I'm sitting there telling him, and I'm leaning over the couch talking to him, 
Um, we have this air freshener, which is like a, um, it's not the kind of you plug into the wall. It's more like you just sit down, like on something, table, whatever, sit on the window seal, it has like a plastic cap to it. And it has like the air, you know, so, like, so there's no type of um, combustion or no type of air buildup or anything like that. It's just there, you know. Well, it was sitting on the kitchen window seal and it flew across, over top of his head when he was getting a drink of water, flew probably about 15 feet, nailed a pop can sitting on the dining room table. As I'm sitting there watching this thing fly straight up and down across two rooms and nailed a pop can, just sitting right on the dining room table. I mean, if, if it wasn't for that pop can, it probably would have hit me in the face. So instantly, we just like froze. I mean, we were just both, we were really freaked out about that. It was so loud that Jason was upstairs um, and he heard it. So he came downstairs and we we're explaining to him what's going on. And now Jason's my 15 year old boy and he's getting freaked out because of it. And um, so we decided to go, uh, well, we picked up the air freshener, put it, up, put it back on the window seal. And then, you know, picked up the pop can, put it on the table. And we went up and told Misty what was going on. So she comes downstairs and uh, we're all just kind of investigating, looking around. And uh, Misty's like, well, let's go back, you know, come upstairs with me and lay down. So uh, as I was heading up there and we're laying down talking in the bed, Jason and Timmy stay downstairs. And it sounded like Jason and Timmy ran up the steps. I mean, it was that loud. It was like boom, 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 all the way up the steps. And I'm standing there waiting for someone to turn the corner and nobody turned the corner. So I text Timmy, like as soon as I heard him, I said, is that you coming up the steps? He says, no, I thought that was you coming down the steps. So and like right there, I was like, okay, I'm not getting out of this bed, <laughs> right? So, you know, um, more things happened downstairs, which I wasn't down there, but Jason, he kind of, he kind of witnessed it. But uh, so the next morning my wife gets up, you know, and she takes the air freshener and she throws it away right before she goes to work. Now, Timmy was there to uh, babysit Mason for me, which is my five-year-old, and uh, as I was going to work. So when I got up in the morning, that air freshener was back on the window seal, right? So, or no, actually was sitting on the, uh, on the island in the kitchen. It was sitting there, which I didn't know my wife threw it away. So it was sitting there, and Timmy was asleep, and um, I think Mason was asleep too. So I picked it up, and I threw it away. And that, as I threw it away, I actually took the trash back out of the trash can and threw it in the trash can <clears throat> outside. When my brother-in-law was there, his, uh, his ex-wife comes over to the house with his kids and they're talking and he's explaining to Amy everything what's going on and what he saw, which he's not here right now to witness it, but um, she said, what air freshener, this one? And she pointed at the one that was sitting on the window sill, which was the same air freshener that my wife threw away and I threw away. And that's unexplainable how that one got ended up back on the window seal. There was also a night where we were laying in bed and I was taking pictures of Mason and I actually have a picture on my phone still to this day of a um, image and it's like a, um, like a, I don't know, like a, like a, it's hard to explain. I mean, it's just something you would have to see. Um, and I kept, I said, well, maybe I was moving my camera to where that image showed up somehow. So I kept taking pictures and I have that on my phone as well. And I just could not get that shot again. And um, also I've been laying in bed and um, fell asleep and woke up because I tend to get up through the night for some reason and looked over and on the wall um, where the stairs come up and the wall um, by the doorway, I seen two hands, but it was like, it wasn't flesh hands. It was like, um, almost like bones in a way. It was kind of hard to see pressing on the wall. I don't know, it gives me the goosebumps just talking about it now. <laughs> um, I have no clue, but I just know I laid there like, oh my gosh. <laughs> So um, I didn't want to sleep in the room or go in the room by myself anymore after stuff started happening. First time something bad happened, which I wasn't really there a lot at first, so like I didn't really know about anything. And so like my sister, it was her birthday. She actually had a sleepover with a couple of her sisters and I'm in my room was like 
like kind of over here so I could see her room perfectly. And so uh, I'm sitting there and like I'm laying on my bed and I can see her door perfectly. And I'm texting all of a sudden like they're all just in there playing and her door just like closes. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, I guess they're trying and they're doing something I thought. And like, so like Mariah's like, and like whispering, saying something that I'm there. And I'm just sitting there watching them. All of a sudden the door opens again, they open it. And then like all of a sudden, like it shuts again. So they're like, Jason, if you don't stop, um, I'm gonna go tell dad. So like they open it and all of a sudden it just slams really hard, like really hard. Like they opened it and it's just like, I don't even know, it's hard. And so my sister freaks out and she's just like, opens the door and runs downstairs and my dad comes in. He's asked me if I'm doing it and I was like, no. Like, I was actually sitting there watching it. So, you know, that's when it came to my head. Like, I don't know. I started thinking about if maybe if there's something in the house or not. And so it was about three or four weeks later, my uncle would spend the night and uh, I was up there texting again. And uh, all of a sudden, like I hear like something just hit something really hard downstairs. So I'm just sitting there for a minute and then I run downstairs and I see uh, my dad and my uncle just sitting there on the couch, just freaked out. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? So they explained it to me. And uh, I'm sitting there on the couch with my uncle and my dad goes upstairs, tell my mom and all of a sudden, my uncle, he, he's, he gets up and demonstrates what happened and he's doing it. And all of a sudden there's curtains from where the like Everfresh bottle was, it starts shaking like crazy. Like it just starts shaking, like someone pulled it shaking. And like pretty much after that, he turns around and I'm just like, crazy he runs upstairs I'm just sitting there cuddled up I'm scared he runs back downstairs and like he gets back over there and he's showing Rusty and like I remember the door where Rusty went back upstairs and he's like showing me what like I don't know how to explain it um he was pretty much like just like uh tell me uh how should I put it like he went back to what happened just happened with the curtains and like he's over there for some reason, I don't remember. And like the cabinet door right there just slammed. Like it was open and just slammed. And so at that time we both run upstairs and like we're telling Rusty and he's just sitting up there and then my mom and them freaked out. We go back downstairs and then all of a sudden we hear like, it sounded like me and him just run back up the stairs again. And it wasn't us and Rusty comes back downstairs and asked if we did it and we were like, no. So he's like, well, that's pretty creepy. And Time went on after that night, and uh, I was pretty much after that, which I was pretty scared. So like I was sleeping in the living room most of the time now, cause I was scared. And um, it was about I don't know, it was like maybe a week after. I'm up in my room after school is like three o'clock, and uh, like I'm I'm doing homework on my little counter, and all of a sudden like I hear like I hear like something talking to me. Like I can't tell, like it's something really light, like I couldn't really understand. And like, so I'm sitting there listening, like I stopped doing everything and all of a sudden like, like clearly like in a, like a, like in a growlful voice, like it tells me to get out. And so I just like take off after that and I'm running down the stair and that's actually what I tell my mom. Like that it told me that and I was pretty freaked out after that. Like I knew there was something in the house for sure. We were getting our electric switched over like a week goes by or two weeks goodbye, and um, the elect an electric go or we were getting electric switched over from Melissa's name to our name, and um, when we were getting it switched over, uh, the kids and everybody were too too afraid to be there at the house with it being dark, and I had to work that night. So um, later on that night. Er uh, Jason, Mariah, and Mason and Misty all went to Jason's friend's house. Me and Tim had to go paint an apartment that night, so we didn't get back till late. Well, I had to go grab some of my clothes, my toothbrush, and everything like that, and I just stayed at Timmy's house. And uh, when we were in there, I was like, well, let's just see what happens. So I'm in there, and I'm, I'm asking just out loud questions, like, if you're in here, make some noises, or uh, can you make yourself known, or anything like that. And um, we're standing, not, we're standing like in the living room because when you come into the front door, there's a living room and there's like an archway and that's when it's the big open area of the kitchen, dining room, the living room. And I'm standing here, my brother-in-law standing here and we're face to face and I'm asking questions. I have a flashlight and it's pitch black in here. And I'm asking, are you the thing that ended up throwing that air freshener across the room? And then I heard something scraping behind Tim. And when I, and when I glanced the flashlight over to look, 
the picture frame was swinging like something walked over and just smacked the corner of the picture frame and started swinging and it slowly just came to a stop. I said, do that again. Within maybe a minute or two later, it did it again. And we're both like face to face looking at each other and we just, I grabbed my stuff and we just left. So, um, you know, we get the electric and everything turned back on the next day. And, you know, I told Misty, you know, the experience that I had and they, um, ended up telling the experience that Jason and everybody else had. And Jason even had friends come over to help, you know, because they're all too scared to go in there. So Jason's uh, friends and their older brother and everybody came over and they even witnessed stuff in there too. I'm sure you're going to hear from Jason. But uh, uh, so as uh, time goes on, you know, everybody's like upstairs and they're like at late at night, be sitting there sleeping or whatever. And most of the time I don't get a bit to about midnight or so. And I'd be downstairs watching TV or playing video games or something. It sounds like someone's walking up behind me. Like almost every single night, it sounds like, like I don't, it just sounds like Misty or Jason. I mean, that's how loud the footsteps, not like Mariah or Mason, but it's, it's like, like it's a heavier foot steps, like boom, 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 boom. And, and I turn around, wait for someone to turn the corner, or turn around thinking that somebody's there and there ain't nobody there. And it, was, and it would happen like that all the time. You would hear it all the time. Well, um, you know, I'd, I'd, we ended up going around to blessing the house, me and Misty did. And when we were blessing the house, I mean, you just feel it. I mean, you just feel the hair on your arm stand up. You just feel like you just, it, it felt good. Like we was, like we're uh, releasing something and it actually felt good for maybe a couple weeks when we went around and blessed each door and everything. But it slowly, you can kind of just slowly feel the negativity coming back into the house. Because whatever was in there, it just, I mean, it, you, as a family, I mean, we used, you know, every family has problems, but, you know, but when we get into fights, sometimes it got pretty loud and it got kind of, um, this, like the negativity was just real strong there. And we haven't done nothing like that for a long time. But um, so, uh, man, there's a lot. So when we, um, one night I'm sitting there and I'm in the master bedroom. And, um, you know, everybody's outside. Some people are downstairs. And the uh, master bedroom has the master bathroom. And the, but that door don't lock. So um, I just shut the master bedroom door and I was using the bathroom. I had the door cracked open maybe 10 inches. I mean, it was, it was probably cracked open a nice, nice bed. So I'm, you know, I'm sitting there using the restroom and all of a sudden the door just goes boom. I mean, it closed hard enough to where it wasn't the wind because there was no windows open. And it wasn't, it couldn't have been just, I mean, some houses, yeah, if they're older, maybe doors swing a little bit. But this house is like seven years old. I mean, there's nothing old about this house. So it takes a nice bit of pressure for nice new door hinges to make a door go boom and close the door. So I got up and I looked and there was nobody in the room. Like from, from the angle that I was sitting, I could see if someone walked into the master bedroom because I would see the bedroom door open. That door didn't open. And I opened up the door and I looked around and I said, you know, and I asked if someone was in there or whatever. And I cracked the door back to where it was at and I just gave it a little shove and the door didn't budge. It took a full, a full push to make that door close like it did. So, you know, as time goes on, I just try not to pay no attention to the house because I try not to feed into it. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of make this shorter because there's more, more of us gonna talk about things. But uh, we're packing up and we're ready to go and uh, we're moving out of the house. And we had everything packed up and down in the, down in the uh, living room, kind of like in the garage, but most of the stuff in the garage. And it was probably about three o'clock in the morning and there, you know, we're all sleeping in the master. Me, Misty, Mason, and Mariah, and Jason was downstairs playing video games. But um, it was probably like two, three o'clock in the morning. And it sounded like someone picked up a TV and just slammed it in our bedroom. I mean, it was so loud. It was just like, boom. I mean, it just rocked the bedroom. I mean, it didn't come from downstairs. It came from upstairs. I mean, everybody who was in that room jumped. I mean, it was so loud. I mean, it sounded like a grown man picked up something really heavy and just slammed it. So, I mean, it's something like that wasn't, because there was nothing around for anything to fall like that because all of our belongings were downstairs. So, I mean, anything that was in our room was the bed and us. 
So there's nothing in there for that to be that heavy just to tip over and fall and make that type of noise. We don't have no pets to make that type of noise. So that was pretty, uh, that was pretty freaky. So um, one night we ended up, you know, after we moved out, me and Jason and three of his buddies, we went to Kings Island and then we, um, we went back we went back to that house like maybe one, two o'clock in the morning. We were walking and his, my phone was dead, Jason's phone was dead, but his buddy ended up taking his phone and was recording some stuff. And we was walking through the house and just kind of just asking questions, you know, and trying to speak out loud and trying to get, you know, provoke something or trying to make itself known. And we heard footsteps all upstairs. We heard footsteps coming down the, down the steps. We heard, me and Jason heard growling from the, bet, from the uh, hallway bathroom. Uh, we went upstairs and we was glancing around. Um, I didn't get to see it, but uh, Randy and his buddy saw a shadow go from one corner of the room to the other in one of the bedrooms. Um, while my flashlight is shining in the complete opposite direction in a different room. And uh, well, the kind of the crazy thing is after we did all that, I mean, we caught, we might have caught some things on that. Um, phone I didn't get to look at it all and it was kind of hard to tell what's what because between us whispering and what's going on you couldn't really um, couldn't really uh, figure out what's what but um, what we experienced then was pretty freaky and um, so after that I mean the boys were pretty convinced you know that we talked about I've talked to other people about it but when we took them in there and actually sat stood in the center of the room and just real still real quiet and it sounded like someone was walking above you i mean it's that's that's pretty scary stuff i mean i heard it when i was there by myself in that house come home from work and heard footsteps boom boom and mostly it came from jason's room that's where I, that's mostly where i heard it from jason's room to the hallway and down the stairwells mostly where i heard a lot of the footsteps and if you're downstairs by yourself late at night you would hear someone or something walking up behind you you know uh, doors open and closing in front of your face. I mean, it's just, uh, it was pretty freaky. Well, the night, or the day that we were leaving, I told the kids, because he's at work and Jason was babysitting, and we told them to uh, go ahead and get all their stuff and pull them out of the bedrooms and stuff like that. Well, the people that lived there, they had an older son, he was probably about 18, and he had a lot of his trophies and clothes and stuff up in his closet, which was Mason's old room, and Mason was scared to death to sleep in that room. Well, they ended up finding a Ouija board in there. So we're not sure if that was maybe the reason why that house was haunted. Maybe they pulled some type of spirit through that Ouija board. I mean, I don't know, people say that stuff's fake. Some people believe in it. But for a house to be that new and don't really have a history behind it, uh, whatever that kid done, he pulled something demonic for sure. Because, I mean, this thing is definitely a poltergeist to where it's moving things. I mean, it's throwing it through that air freshener like it was a baseball. I mean, that thing flew like 30, 30 miles an hour across the room. Like I said, it would have smacked me in the face. I mean, it was something there is definitely powerful. A Memorial Day in 1995, uh, my dad woke me up early and I was looking forward to sleeping in and uh, not having to go to school the next that day, uh, but my dad got me up and uh, said, hey, you're coming to work with me. So uh, that day, we went to a house in Georgetown. Uh, this house had been empty a long time and a woman had recently bought it and uh, my dad said she was having trouble keeping people working there on the house because it was haunted. When the lady first purchased the house, she took a picture of the house and there was a man with a handlebar mustache that appeared on the front porch that no one could explain and he definitely wasn't there when she took the picture. So uh, we get there, it's a little bit after, after dawn, uh, my dad, myself and a worker he had working for him named Clarence. Well, my dad sets me outside on the front porch and he's got me standing down the railing in the um, just just basic stuff out there that I couldn't really mess up <laughs> was uh, what the deal was. My dad was working upstairs and the upstairs was uh, filled with bats. And uh, he said, don't go up there, you don't want to get bit by bats or anything. And uh, So the day goes on and I'm expecting to hear something, see something, but nothing happens the whole day. And we come inside and we're eating by the fireplace uh, for lunch and nothing really going on. So uh, the day 
drags on a little bit for me and uh, I'm, I'm sanding and, and trying to clean things up up there. Come in the house, we're doing a little clean up, sweeping, things like that and the end of the day comes and uh, we have to keep the ladders there, my dad said. He says, you need to take them and uh, put them down in the basement. And um, I didn't think it was a big deal at first. Uh, I go around back of the house and it's got like this Wizard of Oz Dorothy doors and um, you walk down these stairs around back and uh, into the basement area. And as I went down into the basement, I took the first ladder down and there was just some stuff there, like some old kids toys and things like that. And uh, I put the first ladder down and I can hear children laughing and I'm kind of looking around thinking, oh, there must be some kids outside, but um, not at all. So I go down there again and there's a bunch of paper, like wadded up uh, old newspaper and stuff like that and it starts spinning in a circle and there's no wind blowing down there. This is inside the house in the basement and I can hear kids laughing. So at that point I jumped out of the house. I go up the stairs and I'm just throwing the ladders down from uh, up, up the, at the top of the stairs. And uh, I go around and my dad and Clarence are sitting in the van. And I say, I'm not going down there. He says, what's going on? I said, I can hear, I hear kids laughing in the basement. And he said, well, the ladder's in there. I said, no, they're not in there. He said, well, they gotta be in there. And I said, I'm not doing it. So he goes down and he puts the ladders down. And um, so I went back to school the next day and uh, my dad goes back with Clarence. And uh, they're getting ready to leave at the end of the day. And my, uh, my dad's sitting out in the van just waiting, waiting and Clarence comes out and he said, oh that was real funny. Real funny what you did to me in there. My dad says, what are you talking about? He said, oh I was in there cleaning up and putting everything away and you kept sneaking up behind me and poking me and taking off real quick. And uh, I could never catch you, but, but I knew it was you. And my dad said, I haven't done that. I, I've been out here waiting for you. And uh, Clarence turned really pale. He turned really white. And uh, after that, he got really sick. He got so sick where he couldn't even get up and move and walk around. So my dad actually took him to his uh, mother's house and, and left him there. And uh, he didn't want to go back to the house. Um, so my dad... And uh, Clarence, they didn't finish the job. They uh, left it. And um, afterwards, um, there was a, the lady who owned the house. She had an exorcis exorcism performed on the house. And uh, there was never an issue. The house was totally restored. And, and it just looks fantastic now in uh, Georgetown, Ohio. The legend of Lucy Run is uh, one of the most popular legends I've ever heard. It's uh, been a story I've been hearing since I was in high school. And when, when it would get dark, and sometimes if there was a full moon, we would always drive down Lucy Run Cemetery Road. The legend of Lucy Run is, uh, it started in 1807. In 1807, there was a woman named Lucy Robinson. Uh, it is thought that she was either the daughter or niece of Charles Robinson, who had recently moved into the area and had a cabin down there. It's believed that Lucy lived in what is presently Withamsville, Ohio, um, in Union Township. Well, Lucy had um, a boyfriend and they were very close. And uh, one day he asked her to come out and meet him. So she, there are a couple of different versions of how she met him. One, she rode a horse to meet him. Another one was that she walked. And uh, she met she met her boyfriend and uh, he told her that he didn't love her anymore, that he had met someone else and he was going to marry that other person. So Lucy was distraught. And this is where the story kind of can go a couple different ways. One was that Lucy ran home, she got a horse and she tried to catch him. But as she tried to catch him there was a storm. Um, another version is, is that she had already ridden the horse and they had met and the storm had started and he took off. And she was distraught and said she was crying so much that she wasn't paying attention to what she was doing as she was riding the horse. Either way, she was riding a horse. So as she was riding and the rain was coming down, there's a creek here on Lucy Run Cemetery Road. And uh, on this creek, it's, it's probably about 10 feet wide now. And uh, she wasn't paying attention to where she was going. And she was thrown off the horse into the creek. 
and the water had risen really quickly. Um, some versions of the story I've heard say that she had there was a flash flood, and Lucy hit the water and hit her head on a rock. And before she knew it, she was pulled under and she was going down this creek, and uh, she never recovered. Now since that night, people have seen her walking from the creek into the cemetery where the Robinson family plot is today. People have said for over 150 years um, that they've been seeing her. You see her all dressed in white. She's white and glowing and she slowly works her way from the creek up this hill through the cemetery on Lucy Run Cemetery Road up to where the family plot is. Um, one of the stories I've heard recently of that uh, is from uh, Claremont County historian Rick Crawford. He was filming with a group of people there, um, I believe from Dayton Public TV, and while they were filming they didn't see anything. They did an interview right outside of the cemetery. But when they played back the footage you could clearly see this white figure walking right through the shot and going up the hill. I've talked to people who have gone down there at night and have heard all kinds of weird noises. Um, I've seen people who say that Lucy's gravestone glows in the cemetery. Now, I have not seen this myself, but I do know that there is a Robinson family plot up there on uh, Lucy Run Cemetery Road. And this is far and away one of the most haunted places that I've heard of in, um, in Claremont County. In Adams County, there's a place called the Wickerham Inn. It was built in 1801 by Peter Wickerham. And this is one of the most haunted places in Adams County. When I went through there last summer, I was going to the um, Serpent Mound. It's uh, one of the biggest Indian mounds in the United States. I went out there and I saw the sign for the Wickerham Inn. I had heard that they were, it was supposedly haunted. And we stopped at at a yard sale and my wife wanted to buy this chair. So we stopped and we asked the lady about the Wickerham Inn and she said, oh yeah, that place is haunted. Yeah, nobody should live there, so they should just burn that place down. Supposedly, this is the oldest uh, brick building in Adams County. Now, the place was renovated in 1922. Since then, several families have moved and came and gone. But the ghost story that has stayed with it all this time since its very beginning is uh, about a man he was traveling and word was that he was bragging a lot about the money that he had with him. Um, I've heard another version where he was just very quiet. When he goes up to his room that night he'd been bragging is the, is the way that I'll take it and he goes up to his room that night and during the course of the night Everything seemed quiet. Uh, the man went up to check on him in the morning and they couldn't find him. There was blood everywhere, but they couldn't find the man. So they tore up the floorboards and they found the body, but they didn't find the head. So ever since that night, people have seen this man, this entity, going through the hallways, going through the house, the stairs, looking for his head. Even after the house was renovated, they still didn't find the head. There are people living there right now, um, haven't been there very long, and I don't think they'll stay very long. Everybody I talk to in Adams County says that that place is haunted, that place needs to just be torn down. So if you're going through Adams County, make sure you stop and at least get a picture of the Wickerham Inn. In 2005, I worked in a factory and um, I got to hear a great ghost story and I wanted to share it with you guys today. Now, the guy who told me this story, his name was Scott Case. And in high school, he uh, went and hung out with uh, one of his friends, spent the night uh, in the New Richmond area, New Richmond, Ohio. And uh, they live right next to a cemetery. So his dad pretty much mowed around the gravestones and things like that. They took care of it. 
so one night, the uh, guys were out there kind of playing around just outside. And they go up the hill, because the cemetery's on a hill. And um, they look out into the woods, and there's a big open field on the other side of those woods. And they see a light there, and they're like, wow, I wonder what that is. And they'd never seen it before. So they walked across this field, and there were some people out there. They had a fire going, and they're just, hey, come on over. You know, so they came over and they said, oh, hey, how's it going? And they hung out with these guys all night. They really liked them, liked them so much they wanted to come back again the next day. So they went home that night and thinking, wow, those people are really cool. I can't believe I didn't know those people were there. Well, morning comes and these guys have slept just about till noon. And they go out and they're going to go and see these guys again. Well, they go out to the spot in the field where they had talked with the people and hung out with them the night before, and nothing's there. The house that was there, that all that's left is what's left of a foundation. They later found out that that house had burned to the ground. So whoever they were talking to that night, or whatever they saw that night, was not really there. And it really freaked them out. Um, you would think, being right next to the cemetery, the cemetery would freak them out. But it was actually this house that disappeared, and the people that disappeared with it. That's one of the um, just weirdest things I've ever heard because I've heard of, you know, people being in the house, but the house still being there, even though the people know, are no longer there, but the whole entire house being gone, that's, that's pretty creepy. In our world, there are all kinds of animals mythical animals that nobody's been able to track down but people claim exist. One of those are in Loveland, Ohio. The Loveland Frog is a legend that goes all the way back to 1955. There was a businessman who was driving through the Loveland area near a bridge and he saw some creatures that he described as about three feet in height that looked not like people, but they had wide mouths with no lips, where there was supposed to be hair on their heads, there were instead wrinkles. And this man reported this. In 1972, police officers in Loveland saw a creature they described as a four-foot man with lizard-like appearance, and they were out on patrol while they were driving. And as they got closer, they spooked the creature, and the creature jumped over a guardrail into the Little Miami River. Two weeks later, Officer Mark Matthews saw the frog again and apparently took shots at it, but the creature escaped. A local farmer is said to have seen the creature one month later while riding a bike. Although the officers didn't report the incident, it was leaked to the media, and the legend of the Loveland Frog continues to grow to this day.
The only witch trial in recorded Ohio history happened in 1803 in Bethel, Ohio. The uh, person who was accused was a Miss Nancy Evans. Her home would have resided right now where there is currently a uh, speedway station. It's on the corner of 125 and 232. There's actually a dip there where the pond where she was actually tried once was. Now, Nancy was accused by one of her neighbors, the uh, Hildebrand family. They had two teenage daughters who were young and had some really active imaginations. And one of the things they accused her of is have, since she had a black hat, that that black cat was actually a demon that was communicating it was a servant of uh, the devil. So for years they complained about her and uh, one time they actually tried to capture her. They tried, as she would go out at night, they would thought that they could capture her, her witch spirit. Um, and they tried to capture her in a bag of Lindsay Woolsey. Now, she was actually tried the way they tried her, if she would have been found guilty, she would have had one or two things happen to her. One, she would have been burned at the stake. Two, she would have been drowned. So they have this big event um, at the pond where she lived. They put a scale out. And um, on one side of the scale, it was one of those scales where it was kind of like a teeter-totter, so it kind of evens out. On one side they had the Bible, and the other side was her. Now if the Bible weighed more than she did, she was a witch because the truth and the strength of uh, the Bible and God's Word would prove that she wasn't a witch. Well, as it turned out, she wasn't a witch and she was acquitted and the Hildebrand family was ran out of town. My name is uh, Greg Pollitt. I'm founder of Paranormal Nights, uh, an investigation team into the paranormal. Um, we go to people's homes trying to investigate and back up their claims and businesses. Uh, we try to find any local legends that, that may appear for us to investigate and find evidence to back up or to find the truth of what's going on, whether it's proof of the paranormal or just an old legend. Um, when you kind of fall into this, you're, you're really chosen. Many, many people that I've talked to, including myself, uh, that have started into the paranormal has had an experience uh, that has reached out to a religious leader or someone that they felt they could trust and seek out help of something, you know, to find answers of something they've experienced. And unfortunately, a lot of those people don't have answers either. Uh, and they kind of shunned away from giving guidance. So that most of the people you talk to that have gotten into this field, that's one of the primary things that got them into it, was not finding answers from anyone and needing answers for themselves. So they started investigating themselves. Uh, I've had many experiences over my lifetime. I've not experienced everything under the sun like a lot of people claim. Uh, I have seen a couple uh, full-bodied apparitions, a couple partial apparitions, a lot of shadows. Um, one thing you kind of have to do when you start investigating is train yourself, or I should say untrain yourself. As a kid growing up, if you experience something in your bedroom or anything like that, mom and dad's first reaction is to console you, tell you there's nothing there, go back to sleep, everything's okay. So you're conditioned as you grow up to dismiss things. If you see a shadow out of the corner of your eye, you're like, okay, it's just my eye playing tricks on me. Or you hear a noise in the house, it's just the heating pump. You know, you automatically dismiss it and don't investigate it. Um, the truth is there's a lot of things that could be going on there that is not just the heating turning on. Um, that could be more in the paranormal world. Hi, I'm Garrett co-founder of Paranormal Nights and lead investigator. My name is Noah Maisel. I'm coming up on a, right about 30 years old. I've been in the field of paranormal research since I was right about 10 years old. I take it very seriously. I am extremely opinionated on it. 
not really willing to uh, to take most most things like a lot of people at face value. I've seen a lot of things and done a lot of things that a lot of people don't understand and some people can't just can't comprehend. I've been trying to assist people all over the country, uh, even a couple outside of the country, with what I know to be the best ways to deal with things in the paranormal or just the non-understood side of the world. I have seen things that are impossible. I have experienced things that most people will just never understand. I'm going to talk about a couple of those today, try to clear up a couple things, and probably lay a little bit thicker of an opinion than some people want to hear. But uh, like I said, that's just the way that I am. Hi, my name is Sean Muller, 31 years old. Uh, originally I started ghost hunting when I, when I actually met up with Noah. Um, know Noah pretty much my whole life. Had an experience 15 years ago that actually intrigued us to get started. I'll let you guys know how this all started. I'm your typical kid, you know, heard of Casper the ghost. I know that's laughable. I was just interested in the things that go bump in the night ever since I could crawl. Just before I turned 13 years old in Anderson Township, Cincinnati, not so many miles from where I'm sitting right now, my father was murdered. It was a couple days before my birthday, so it wasn't the most pleasant experience, but that's not really what I'm here to talk about. It's the activities that happened after that with multiple members of the Cincinnati Police Department, um, even you know EMS members that were there, family members, neighbors, the people that were in my home over the next several days saw things that most people would, for lack of a better way to say this, for most people would say that they were right out of a horror movie. Things that are impossible. From the corniness of plates flying out, which really isn't corny when you actually see it, to, uh, well, I don't want to exaggerate here, I'll call it about a two or three inch thick oak double door ripped off of its hinges. Well, that's definitely impossible until you see it happen. The sounds of screaming, doors slamming, voices being heard. Now, when you see something like that and you experience something like that, it's going to grab your attention. Some people can handle it, some people can't. But I didn't have a choice. I had to understand that what was going on around me was impossible. And when you watch something that's impossible, you have to accept that it really is possible. And getting past that in your own brain is a very hard thing to do. But I did. And it delved me deep into the world of trying to figure out how things like this could happen. What can cause them? What can stop them? What can hinder them? how they come about, where they come from, their origins. And we eventually, 10 years down the road, started up our own group called Ghost, uh, Ghost Hunters Southern Ohio team. Me and Noah did that for about three and a half years. Uh, upon doing our own team, we actually met up with some other um, well-known names, such as Shannon Sylvia, Patty Starr, um, Going back to Patty Starr, she's actually the one who actually got us started. Uh, Patty is the one who introduced us to the whole field of ghosts, uh, from everything, how to use the tools, get out on the field, and what to look for, experiences that may happen. Um, the, the biggest thing I can remember is from starting out, I was a skeptic at first. Um, what got me intrigued was the stuff that happened years ago. So I, I had to know more about what it was. Um, Noah eventually got the courage to want to find out more. And that's what takes us back to Patty. It is for Christmas, about 15 years, or 10 years ago, Noah had gotten us two training classes to go out and meet with Patty Starr. 
took the classes. It was a weekend long. Learned more than I could ever imagine. Um, right after that, it wasn't but two weeks when we were actually out doing our first uh, ghost hunt. Um, upon doing our first ghost hunt, we came across many different apparitions, uh, you know, things that we thought were orbs, and you know, ha having to learn the difference between orbs and dust. And eventually, after you get doing it for a while, you understand the difference. Now, studying things like this, you have to look at the religious side, you have to look at the scientific side. And for the people out there that think it's all a hoax, or the people that think it's all religious, or they think it's all scientific, well, if you think it's any one of those three things, then you're wrong. Yep, I'm judging you and telling you that you're wrong because you have to understand all of them and realize that these things are based in all of the above. So many things that unfortunately we have been shown on television shows and movies are fake, but not all of them. So many people have unfortunately profited from the pain and suffering of others in a field of research that is very real tragically real in many cases. I have seen and experienced the real part of it. People, I'm telling you, this isn't a world for everybody. Now, unfortunately, these television shows and these movies have made it disgustingly popular that if you go grab a camera and you watch a couple episodes or something on some corny channel, that obviously you're a professional ghost hunter. Well, that's not how it works. Most people should not be partaking in activities like this. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with not partaking of them. There are people that are designed for things. There are a lot of things that I'm not good at. But unfortunately, one of the things that I am is understanding how to deal with what causes, how to accept how to explain to, I could keep going on, on the, the field of paranormal activity. And again, I'll go back to it. If you don't understand the religious side, the scientific side, and everything in between the two, then you don't understand what this is about. I have seen families torn apart because of not understanding what these things, what these things can cause. I have seen people die. I have seen dead people come back in ways that people just don't get because they've watched television shows that make it all into a big joke. I have been to houses that people don't understand or how they, how they should still be in existence. You know, here's one that I, I talk about that most people don't like to hear, but I've got to say it. I've been to churches that I really wish were never built. In fact, not all that far from where we are right now, there was a church originally built in the late 1700s. Now, some of the parishioners of this church don't know its history, but unfortunately, why this church was built was to cover the heathen souls. It was built over a Native American graveyard. Now people, I'm not saying that's every church, but unfortunately, humanity isn't always about smiles and rainbows. We've done some bad things, and some of those bad things will stain themselves on this world. Now, now, I'm not saying every ghost out there is an evil thing. I've played tag with ghosts that just don't understand that they should have passed a long time ago. I've captured footage that lots of people will say is fake. Well, guess what? You can't say it's fake when you're there. I've had conversations just like you talking to your friend, that crystal clear not show up on audio whatsoever, but I've sat there and spoken to things that weren't there. No, not in my head for the person that just cracked the joke about that. 
Some of the things I can talk about, some of them I can't. I've worked with police across the country. Some of the things that I've found, I don't even understand how we did. Since I was a kid, I've had people try to come to some of these activities with me, and some are just friends, and some are people that I didn't like, but I was just being polite. Because everybody always wants to go and be scared. Everybody wants to get their blood boiling and their nerves going. Well, that's not why I'm in it. I have stopped things that could do more damage than anybody can comprehend. I have been stopped by things that can do more damage than anybody can comprehend. I have had my flesh torn. I have been caused to be ill. And you name it, I've, I've been through it. And I'm not going to leave this field. Because like I said before, I'm tragically good at this. And I'm going to continue to help those that I can. And I'm going to continue to talk negatively about the people that act like they know what they're doing and don't. The sellouts that got some right producer to give them the rights to a show in which their creative team are the ones that make the things that go bump in the night. Again, I'm not trying to tell you that nobody can handle this, but most can't. The other things that helped, you know, build us, um, you know, as a team was the introduction of bringing Greg in. Um, Greg actually, you know, showed us things that we didn't know. So as an investigator, you have to untrain yourself or uncondition yourself to be open to those things. When you see movement, you have to direct your attention to it, try to find out what moved, to seek out whatever you can find that made that movement, whether it is a heat pump kicking on or car lights reflecting through a window or Uncle Tom's ghost running around there causing all kind of chaos. Um, children are awesome, awesome investigators. Not that you should ever take a child as an investigator, but they are open to everything. They're not conditioned to the way the world is, the way we are today. Um, so you kind of need to listen to them as a parent if something is going on. One way you can tell the difference between an overactive imagination and an imaginary friend or something going on is most kids that have an imaginary friend, they just play with them, they're playing with toys, whatever. You know, and they'll maybe occasionally try to blame them for something. Oh, Tommy broke the dish, mommy, not me. Um, one big thing you should look for, for a danger aspect that could potentially be something else, is if they do something that puts them in danger and tells them that their imaginary friend told them to do it. If it's something completely out of the norm, like my imaginary friend told me to climb this ladder and jump off, you know, that's, that's something you want to pay a little more attention to and could be something else. Uh, as far as me, I was the tech specialist for the team, setting up everything, going back, reviewing the video, audio, EVPs. Um, then uh, about three years ago, me and Noah actually stopped our crew of Ghost, and Craig split off into his own, which is now Paranormal Nights. Um, I was out of the field for about a year and a half. Craig had called me and asked me if I wanted to join in with his team. I decided to do it because just everything that had happened still was unanswered, and we had to figure out more. So since then, you know, we've gone many different places, schools, churches, um, just all over Louisville, Lexington. Georgetown, you know, anywhere you can imagine. Um, another experience that was different was going to Bobby Mackey's where we actually went with Shannon Sylvia who was on the original Ghost Hunters International. Um, it was quite an experience being with someone like that who had the background. From her we learned a lot more um, upon all the other people who were there. Um, it was just more of knowing what to look for, what to do, and what not to do. Um, doing
doing ghost hunting, it has its limits. You, you don't want to take it too far. I mean, things can happen, but you know, that's nor here nor there. The few and far between people that I've worked with that can handle it are people that I would work with in any situation. They are willing to put their very livelihood, the safety of their families, because things can absolutely follow you and stick to you. So they're willing to put themselves, their families in danger to help those that need it. Now the term brother is thrown around very loosely. But whether it was a guy or a girl, if it's somebody that I've worked with that I would do these actions with to try to help those people out there that need it, they are my kin, my brothers, my sisters. Because the danger that you put yourself in to do these things is very real. The damage that can be done to you when you don't know what it is you're dealing with is very real. Some people call me a little long-winded. I can't say these things long enough. I can't repeat myself enough times. There are people that are designed to do this and there are people that aren't. I've chosen to work with a couple that I would trust with my very life, that on multiple occasions I've absolutely had to. There's a lot of things that I do that even some of them I would ask them not to. And it's not for thrill seeking. Most of what myself and my team do cannot and will not be captured on any device. We use dozens of different recording devices from professional to corny, from analog to digital, computers, thermals, FLIRs, trap cameras, you name it, we've used it. We've worked with the people that call themselves professionals. We've worked with people that you'll never hear of. Some of them absolutely know what they're doing. Most of them don't. You take a room full of 10 people these days and nine of them will tell you that they've hunted ghosts before because they went and got a camera and turned the lights out and said Bloody Mary into the mirror three times. The things that have been popularized should have never been. Because all they're doing is feeding the negativity that can cause more and more of these things to happen. I've been to houses where I have seen things that most people should never have to see. I've seen people lose their lives. had damage done to me that it's not that I want to have it done, but better it happened to me than one of your children. Better it happened to me than you. Because people are designed for different things. I uh, recently had an investigation in Morrow, Ohio. Um, pretty intense. Um, history pretty much uh, based off of two murders of uh, a guy's wives. Um, both were injected. Um, had a lot of activity. Um, some really good EVPs, which is electronic voice phenomenon. Um, a lot of shadow activity, door slamming. Client brought us in to uh, evaluate their claims. Through the years I've been to many places, uh, from homes to businesses to cemeteries. Um, one of the most recent cases we had was a home in Morrow, Ohio. Um, our client had called us. She had been experiencing uh, door slamming and locking. Um, she had been experienced, a, a friend of theirs, a family actually, had been scratched in the driveway. Um, their car mysteriously had lights come on and off. Um, while also in the home, they could hear things being dragged around in the attic. Uh, they could hear um, people saying their names and could not find anything to, to prove that it was something normal. So they called us to come in. Um, as we got there, we set up, we started interviewing her. While we were doing that, we were recording with video and taking still pictures. 
Um, in the picture process, we found several images where the woman's face was smudged out. You can make out detail in every other thing, from her clothing to her hair to the background, but her face looked like someone had just smudged it out in a digital picture, which is very difficult to do. Um, during this process, our tech guy had captured uh, a video, or I'm sorry, a picture um, of something that seemed to appear in front of the woman early on. Didn't say anything to us, not to influence the investigation or anything of that nature, and just kept it as a control factor. Um, as we left, he showed us the picture, and you could see Noah with his back to the camera. To his right was the woman who lived there, and there's an image of something manifesting right in front of her. Uh, very, very creepy and cryptic looking. Um, looks very scary. Um, later upon further analysis, we found another image uh, with a couple little creatures. It's the best way we can describe it. Um, in front of the couch. Um, never seen anything like this. I've talked to religious experts. Uh, I've talked to people uh, at colleges that teach um, anthropology and stuff like that that have no explanation for it. They've never seen anything like it. Uh, so we have some proof of, we believe, definite proof of the paranormal that will blow your mind. Uh, it's complete, out of the box, You've never seen anything like it. And it makes you believe that there are things that go bump in the night. Um, some of the claims were that it was on an ancient Indian burial ground. Um, couldn't really find any information on that because the Indians didn't keep any type of records and uh, the township didn't have any records of uh, Indians being on the property. Um, but townsfolk had uh, said that there was Indians. Uh, we did get a couple of um, EVPs that are not a recognizable uh, language. Um, some of the other EVPs uh, were from a female voice. I, we believe it was the one that belonged to the apparition, uh, saying that they were injected, um, which kind of backed their claims uh, that, and the information that they gave us prior to some of the investigation. The things we saw in this house, to put it lightly, I want the house torn down and sealed and nobody to live in it. There is a family living in there. There has been multiple families over, from what we understand, a little over a hundred years living in this home. It's been modified many times. The activities that took place in this house are everything from the lights coming on and off, to doors slamming shut, to doors locking on us. That one gets real special. Um, but they weren't just in the house. They weren't just in the back of the house. They were all around. Uh, one of our cars got locked up and the, uh, the alarm kept going off. Now, anything, you can prove that anything was fake, unless you're there <laughs> and you see that nobody faked it or touched it. We saw the good old shadow people in the windows. We got temperature variations. Um, well, here, on that note, People think two to three degrees is a temperature variation. No. A 10, 15, 20 degree variance, watching water boil when there's no heat source and or freeze on the same note, that is a temperature variance. Those are both things we got there. Um, I won't mention his name because it's not the most pleasant thing, but you think the little scrapes that you've seen on TV or something, well, they're nothing. So you get somebody that looks like they just got attached by Freddy Krueger, letting blood out of their own flesh when nothing touched them, that's the sort of stuff that happened at this house. From small things to little things, from the minute we got in there, which it was fully light out, it was chock full of every experience you could name. The mother in this home which we later found out had unfortunately partaken in some activities that she shouldn't have. Things like 
playing with Ouija boards, things like talking to people that practice in cult activities. Well, she can't show up on a camera. Yep, you can absolutely say that that can be fake too. Well, although I'm not going to tell you where it is, believe me, if you're one of the people that knows it, look through every picture you've tried to take of her. I bet they didn't come out. Especially when you're taking a group photo and her face is scratched and or blurred out or just not on the picture at all and everybody else is just fine. Now unfortunately, the activities that she took, she partake, she had practiced or been a part of just compounded the issues that were already in the home. We found out that there was two different murders in that house that we never knew about. We absolutely went to the police afterwards and guess what? We found out what caused it, when it had happened, who had did it, and we were exactly right. Things that we didn't know about. We got words chanted over and over again. We picked up multiple entities, if, you want, if that's what you want to call them. This was one of the more negative places I have ever been. People, I've seen exorcisms. I've seen completely BS things. I've gone into homes where people have set up hidden speakers to make sounds show up, traps in their home to make it look like doors can swing open or closed. This wasn't fake. Two members of the team couldn't, couldn't quite take what was going on in there. So they decided to go outside until things got so bad outside the house that they actually wanted to come back in. Because if those things are gonna happen, you might as well be with somebody. One of the daughters in the home that we since have found out, well, at least we think we found out, she's no longer there, is now suffering from severe psychological problems severe depression issues, has gone through multiple relationships. You, you know, there's a lot of things that happen to people that they don't understand what it causes. And until you can understand that some of these things really aren't your fault, they're caused by outside influences, well, this house was full of all of them. <laughs> From daylight to nighttime, no matter who was in there. It's one of the worst locations I've ever been in. Power surges that just made no sense. Power drains that made no sense. We later found out that there's even a good old hidden buried cellar out back. Now I say buried as in we can't get into it. But with the right equipment, which I might just try to get into sometime, there's rumors that there's stuff under the ground there that most people really shouldn't deal with. But anything can be dealt with. So we might just be back out at this location at some point or another to try to help. Because that's what we can do. For the people that live in this home, for the people that have lived in this home, the ones that are still alive and the ones that aren't, at some point or another you may or may not see all this. But I really do feel sorry for anybody that's been in there alive or dead. There are places in this world that are just evil. And that's one of them.